Good evening, everyone. My name is Sherry Booth, and I'm the Associate Vice President of Philanthropy and Alumni Engagement. And I'm really excited to be here. We're in person, first time in three years, for this wonderful esteemed lecture, the Harry Kitchen Lecture Series in Public Policy. And we were enjoying the title of this lecture, What Goes Around Comes Around, or Does It? So we're looking forward to hearing that discussion tonight. Uh, we would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabeg, who have shared with us their teachings, and the First Nations who care for this earth and share their teachings, and may we honor those. Now, on behalf of Trent University, it is my honor to welcome you to the series tonight. And I'd like to say, I'd like to welcome all those that are online, because there's a whole nother layer of audience watching us tonight. So welcome all of you from coast to coast to coast and around the world, wherever you may be. Welcome to Trent University. At Trent, we strive to be strong partners with our communities, enhancing the culture of Peterborough, enhancing the knowledge that we can share. And uh, that's what we're doing tonight, and we'd love to give back to our community. But tonight is thanks to the generosity of Professor Emeritus, Harry Kitchen, who we all know and love. This lecture was founded in 2007 at the time of Harry's retirement, and uh, it honors his contributions to research and uh, in public policy and economics. Now, we do these annually, and we did do them during the last uh, couple of years. They were all online. So uh, we brought thought leaders to the campus, sharing their wealth of knowledge in public policy and economics. So uh, on behalf of Trent University, on behalf of our community, and on behalf of our students and the folks here tonight, thank you, Harry, for sharing your vision and dedication and creating this legacy here at the university. I'd like to take a moment now to invite uh, the director of our School of Business, Byron Loon, to come and introduce the series. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. I'm Byron Liu. I'm the chair of the Department of Economics and, and also the director of the School of Business, but that's a light load. Um, the Harry Kitchen Lecture Series was established upon Harry's retirement by friends, colleagues, and associates. And the inaugural lecture in 2007 was given by Thomas Kershane of Queen's University. Since then, we've had 11 more speakers, so tonight will be our lucky number 13. This series enables us to bring experts in their fields to enlighten us on current and relevant issues in public policy. It is an opportunity for students, for faculty, for alumni, and members of the community to hear the most informed views on problems and issues facing us today. We have heard both from academics and from senior civil servants. Last year, for example, we heard from Carolyn Watkins, former deputy governor of the Bank of Canada, and she told us about cryptocurrency. Tonight's talk promises to be as interesting as any yet. So with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Professor Harry Kitchen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Byron. Uh, I might just mention a word about uh, how this um, lecture started. I, did actually, I didn't actually initiate it. Um, back when I retired, it turned out that my wife and Torben, who's chair of the economics department, who's here tonight, decided they'd run a retirement party for me on New Year's Eve. Everybody was invited to a retirement party in, except for me, and I got an invitation inviting me to a reunion for an old-timers hockey team that I'd played on for years. It turned out I was the only one in the room who had that invitation. <laughs> Nevertheless, when I got there, I found out it was for a different purpose. And it was announced that night by Torben that funds had been raised, a uh, considerable amount, I must admit, from people um, to support this, this lecture. So uh, I'm certainly uh, dedicated to that, but, um, and I very much appreciate it. Uh, and I, I must say that the department, I think, has done an excellent job in inviting past speakers. And if you take a look at the hall on the second floor where there are po posters for each one of them, it's quite a distinguished group of, of speakers, and Bill will certainly add to that. Um, <clears throat> I might just very quickly introduce Bill. He's retired chair and professor of economics at McGill University. Um, many of you will know from frequent columns in the Financial Post. He actually writes on almost anything and everything in the Post. If you, if you Google, financial, or Google articles by um, Bill Watson, you will find an incredible range all the way from 
who needs voting or, or vote, what is it, mail in voting or some kind of voting, and I think there's things in there, maybe on marriage at some point or something like that. <laughs> there's a whole range of, of things. He's a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. Um, he while on leave from McGill in 1978 and 98, he served as editorial pages editor of the Ottawa Citizen. Uh, in 1989, he won the National Magazine Awards Gold Medal for Humor for a Peace and Saturday Night Magazine about a trip to New York. His book, Globalization and the Meaning of Canadian Life, published by the University of Toronto Press, was runner-up for the Donner Prize um, for best book on Canadian public policy in 1998. His most recent book, The Inequality Trap, Fighting Capitalism Instead of Poverty, also from the U.S. Press, was shortlisted for the National Business uh, Book Award in 2016. I might also mention this, mention this is not the first time that Bill's uh, been a guest of the economics department at Trent. Back in 1976-77, Bill Hunter, who was here, uh, is here tonight, was in the department along with myself and two or three other economists at the time. Um, we had a tenure track position and we advertised. And I remember Morris Buda was the chair saying, we've got this application from a student who's graduating from Yale. And our immediate reaction was to think, why would anybody from Yale apply for a job at Trent? But nevertheless, we were quite impressed with that and we thought, well, let's invite him. And I remember Bill came and I was mentioning this to him before. He, uh, I probably sat through more than f a large number of seminars and presentations over 40 years at Trent. And there's only one seminar I ever remember, not for content, but for style. And it was the one that Bill gave at that time. And this was the story I related to Brian when, Byron when he invited him. And he said, well, why don't you introduce him then? And uh, I remember he stood up and I was used to economists standing up and presenting mathematical models. And then by the time they got to the halfway down the page, I was lost and then going through some analysis, he stood up and laid out in very solid economic analysis a layman's type description of the issue, and I can't remember what the issue was, but the way he went through that, and I remember saying at the end of that, that was a really good presentation. And of course, if you read a lot of his, his articles, uh, I think they come out exactly the same way. So I think given his wide range of interest in writing some public policy, it's great pleasure that the department and the university welcome Bill who can share his reflections as a 70s guys. Concerns driven by deepening power tensions, a looming energy crisis, inflation, possibly heading to double digits, spiraling public spending and debt, central banks flummoxed, and a Trudeau in the Prime Minister's office. Bill asks, have, have we traveled back to the 70s? So with that, I'd like to welcome Bill. People ask me about the uh, 70s guy. What's a 70s guy? Uh, there is no formal definition of a 70s guy, but in this case, it's somebody who received his training in economics basically in the 1970s and who also last year entered his 70s. I know you'll all be shocked by that. <laughs> but but uh, So I have a perspective that uh, at least some people, uh, judging by their appearance in this room, would not have and I'll try to share that with you uh, tonight. Um, 1970s to the 2020s, or the, does what goes around comes around, does it do that? Uh, here's what I wanna, how I wanna proceed. Uh, I've never done a warm up before the State of the Union uh, before, so we'll, we'll try to get it set up for President Biden. A uh, few preliminaries, uh, little thing, a little about the 1970s, I thought, Everybody would be gray-haired, but some people aren't, so maybe I should say one or two things about the 1970s, uh, which were the times of our youth, many of us here, but uh, our ancient history to most other people. I'll show you some charts. I'm an economist. Uh, I can't avoid charts. I did a speaking tour for the Canadian Embassy uh, through Germany, and uh, the reaction of my German host was as many charts as possible. Uh, so I put together a whole bunch of charts and they did seem to like it. That is the only country where I've had reaction to charts like that. But anyway, uh, I want to spend a little time on why what economists call the misery index uh, increased substantially in the 1970s. I then want to talk about the anguish of central banking, which is the 
the way that one of the central bankers, uh, Arthur Burns, chairman of the Fed, put it when he was finished his term of central banking in 1978. He gave a speech in 1979 that he called the anguish of central banking. It seems he didn't really enjoy his job very much. And if it was in the 1970s, I can understand that. And then today, I want to talk a little bit about whether uh, the, the 2020s are revisiting in many respects uh, what happened in the 1970s and express a hope that they, in fact, aren't. So preliminaries, uh, that's our host. Uh, you got to put up a more recent picture, Harry, and it's, it's kind of, my, I think my, the picture that was in the in display here was of me was at least 15 years old. Uh, it's almost what I looked like in the 1970s. Uh, so, uh, anyway, I was trying to remember if I'd met Harry in the 1970s, and like most things in that decade, I can't really uh, remember it. I suspect it was in the 1980s, the early 1980s, probably at Queen's. Uh, I spent some time there on sabbatical and then teaching during the summers, uh, and really enjoyed my, my time there in the community of economists at Queen's, one of the leaders of of which was uh, Robin Bodway, who's with us in, in the second uh, row. Uh, it was a place that taught me that what you really should do in a university economics department is work really hard and then be convivial and have a good time as possible with your, with your colleagues. And I think that's probably a good recipe for life in general. And observing uh, Harry uh, follow that, uh, working hard and playing hard, uh, was an inspiration, and uh, uh, I'm very grateful for the uh, invitation to come and talk in the lecture that's uh, named after him. I have given many kitchen lectures in my life, uh, usually with an audience of one, my, my wife, uh, Julia, who decided that uh, she would forego this opportunity to come and hear me uh, give yet another kitchen lecture, and she's gone skiing instead. So uh, uh, I won't speak ill of her, uh, despite her choice. Um, what goes around comes around. As, as Harry mentioned in the blurb, great power tensions, like the 1970s, we've got those, a looming energy crisis. Uh, clearly, energy prices uh, uh, spiked last year. Uh, inflation. Is it, heading, or is it heading to double digits? Nobody, uh, most people in this room, uh, by all appearances, never have lived at a time where we had anything like double digit inflation. Are we heading in that direction? Public spending and debts rising, that was typical of the 1970s. Central banks flummoxed. Uh, they had a, a difficult time trying to figure out what to do in the 1970s. It seemed for a time last year that uh, our central bank and other central banks around the world were having an equally hard time. Uh, is the flummox going to last? Uh, and then finally, we do have a Trudeau in charge uh, again, and that had certain effects in the 1970s. Maybe it's having effects now. Uh, I'll start with the decade's seminal event, which I'm sure you all remember from April 1970. Paul quits the Beatles. <laughs> Uh, this was a big shock at the time. Uh, I won't explain who the Beatles are. <laughs> uh, I think most people, even uh, the younger ones, will understand who they are. Um, in one respect, at least, from that time, it was all downhill. Um, here, this was a little before Paul quit. This, of course, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, and that's the first uh, Trudeau, and that was during the uh, Give Peace a Chance tour when uh, they had been uh, naked in bed in Montreal, but to visit the Prime Minister's office, they, John actually put on a tie. Uh, so that was the spirit uh, of the age. It was all downhill after that in terms of music. This is the uh, Hot 100 single of the year. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel, oh, they're okay. Three Dog Night, Roberta Flack, Porny Orlando and Don. You can, you can read those. The groups that were, had number one for the most time during the 1970s, uh, the Bee Gees, uh, Rod Stewart, Elton John, and a couple of others uh, whose names I can't remember at the moment. During the 1960s, it was the Beatles, Elvis Presley, the Supremes, 
the Rolling Stones, and the Four Seasons. I think the 60s have it over the 70s. I don't know anything about music after 1979, so I don't know if the 60s and 70s have it uh, after that, but at that time they did. Um, Oscars, in terms of movies, the 1970s are referred to usually as a classic golden age of Hollywood filmmaking, and those are the uh, best picture uh, uh, films uh, through the 1970s. I, I highlight The Godfather and The Godfather Part II. That, that's the only original and sequel, uh, despite many tries since, that have both won uh, the, most pic both the Best Picture Award. The other thing I note about this is all these movies are about real people. Some of them not very nice real people. Uh, Patton, George Patton, the U.S. military commander, might not have been a very nice person. Uh, Don Corleone had certain, uh, he was strong on family, let's say. Uh, apart from that, he may not have been the nicest uh, person. Uh, Rocky, of course, is a lovable hero. The Deer Hunter was a very uh, uh, movie that uh, left uh, an impression. Kramer and Kramer were having a breakup. But they're real people. Uh, they're not uh, superheroes. In terms of television, I did actually have a television in the 1970s that looked like that. Uh, the top-rated TV shows by year, you know, thank God for Wikipedia. We didn't have Wikipedia in the 1970s. We would have had to go to the library and look up the TV guide. Um, starting off, uh, Marcus Welby, which was uh, had the, the guy who played, had played Father Knows Best in the 1950s, a uh, sort of iconic character, played Doctor Knows Best in the early 1970s. That was the top uh, show in the, in the U.S. And then All in the Family which you may have heard of, became the top-running show for six years uh, in the United States. Uh, have I counted correctly? Five years. Uh, and, uh, you know, people talk about the, the fact that there's a political split in the United States. Uh, the hero or anti-hero of All in the Family, a guy named Archie Bunker, was the original deplorable, <laughs> right? He was... Uh, a supporter of uh, the, he was a member of the silent majority, a supporter of Richard Nixon, possibly a closet supporter of George Wallace, the former governor of Alabama. Uh, and his son, son-in-law, uh, was a liberal Democrat, uh, opposed to the war in Vietnam. And it was obviously very successful. Everybody understood the cleavage that it was uh, talking about and made, made fun of and made jokes of. Uh, so that, that's a time when the United States was quite split politically and leading television shows uh, benefited from that. I, I indicate Happy Days. Happy Days was about the 1950s, but when you see that, you think, well, in the 1970s, Happy Days were the 1970s, in fact, Happy, uh, happy Days. Laverne and Shirley, uh, we lost the actress who played Shirley last week, uh, sadly. Um, I have That's Incredible in green in this source, the TV ratings guide. Uh, that's the first reality TV show that makes the top three. We're all familiar with reality TV shows, but that was the first categorized as a reality TV show. Now, 60 Minutes, which is still on air, and it seems with the same people hosting it, uh, they're propped up every Sunday evening. That was a reality show of sorts, and of course, 60 Minutes is still uh, going. If you like your TV Canadian, uh, those were some of the leading shows in Canada. The one that's still on is the one in the bottom right, Hockey Night in Canada. Professor Suzuki, uh, who's pictured there with the different color of hair than we've grown accustomed uh, to, uh, I guess just stopped recently, or is stopping uh, this year. Uh, geopolitics in the 1970s, the USA against the USSR, right? Uh, and China, China was the far side of the moon, right? Nobody could go to China or come out of China or report from China, uh, so it was an unknown place. The Globe and Mail was one of the first 
I, I hate to use that phrase, uh, but the Globe and Mail was one of the first uh, world newspapers to have a correspondent in China. And of course, in 1972, uh, Richard Nixon, with the help of Henry Kissinger, or Henry Kissinger with the help of uh, Richard Nixon, depending on which uh, person's memoirs you read, uh, made overtures to China basically to try to uh, change the power balance uh, and, and bring in China as an offset to the USSR in the uh, Cold War. 2020's geopolitics, it's now tables have turned, it's the US really against China are the two major uh, powers and Russia is trying to ingratiate itself to China to uh, I'm an economist, I'm, I'm riffing here on uh, geopolitics, but my interpretation is that uh, Russia is trying to ingratiate itself to China uh, so as to offset the balance uh, uh, against the United States. Uh, so there's some, some similarities. Uh, the misery index uh, was devised actually in the 1960s by uh, a Yale economist named Arthur Oaken, who was working in the White House at the time for President Lyndon Johnson, and he devised a discomfort, what he called a discomfort index, uh, to try to describe the state of the economy. And it's a fairly simple-minded, but you know, many people have tried to find other ways of doing it, and simple has great appeal. Uh, you add together the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. Uh, it weights them equally, maybe that's a mistake, uh, but you add them together and, and see what happens. What I've done in this chart is superimpose 19, or, or juxtapose maybe, uh, 1965 through 1980. Anything blue will be that. Blue is the appropriate color for that decade. Uh, and on top of it, or beside it, 2015 on. And my data get to 2022, I'm an economist, I'm tempted to make it up, but I won't. Uh, and uh, so what we can do is try to compare them a little bit uh, and see where they lead. Well, uh, if you look at 1965, misery index of six, uh, the unemployment rate uh, was probably around four. The inflation rate might have been one and a half, two points, something like that. Um, look at 2015, and on, on uh, uh, inflation, we were doing essentially the same. Unemployment, a little bit higher. Right? So a higher misery index for the first few years after 2015 than for the first few years after 1965. Then a bit of a mix. Then the blue stuff goes crazy. Right? You get up above... Uh, what do you get above? You get above 18 in terms of the misery index. And in fact, it's around this time that Ronald Reagan, a candidate for the presidency in the United States in 1980, starts calling the discomfort index the misery index, uh, which caught on much more uh, and uh, uh, really uh, was a sort of uh, uh, albatross around the, the neck of the president he was trying to unseat and did unseat, uh, Jimmy Carter. What happens in our experience, you know, if anything, this is going down, this red stuff, uh, and then COVID hits and it gets a big spike. Unemployment goes way up. Uh, you would have read in the National Post that unemployment was not going to stay high. And uh, of course, it being the National Post, that was correct. So unemployment came down uh, substantially, but then uh, inflation takes over. And so we get a big drop in the misery index, but then starts to rise. Uh, and it rises, you know, pretty steeply and at the same pace as some of the rise uh, in the 1970s. So the question is, what's the rest of the decade going to look like? Is it, it going to be as miserable as the 1970s, or is it going to be a little better? Now, I guess we should get into some detail about uh, what went on in the, in the decade, although this is obviously uh, uh, a selective uh, history. The stuff in black is just kind of ordinary events, or the, at least there's no theme to it. The blue stuff is technology, uh, 
1970, uh, IBM uh, released the first floppy disk. I realized I may have to explain both what is IBM and what's a floppy disk. Floppy disks were a big deal when they came in. They weren't such a big deal when they went out because they did go out. And now, of course, nobody uses them. VCRs, also a relic of the past, but a fantastic deal. People paid thousands of dollars for 200-pound <laughs> VCRs that were, you know, big and, and anyway, they couldn't play very well. Pocket calculators. Uh, the Concorde was an airplane. Uh, used to fly supersonically between uh, London and Paris and uh, New York. Atari 2000, I'm unfamiliar with that, but apparently it was a famous uh, video game. Uh, the Sony Walkman, I had a Sony Walkman, also about a four-pounder, uh, and uh, it played, it would play, it, it, w it could store up to, you know, 16 songs at a time. Uh, and this was, uh, nothing uh, like it would ever have to be invented again. Uh, was the feeling many of us had. Uh, the red stuff is economic policy. The United States is a free market uh, uh, country, but in 1971, uh, the U.S. introduced wage and price controls. Uh, it was uh, going off uh, the gold standard, the gold exchange standard. Uh, it wasn't going to redeem. You couldn't go to Fo Fort Knox anymore and you know, hand in money and, and get gold uh, back, you could never actually do that anyway, but uh, people would do it on your behalf. They were going to stop doing that. But President Nixon, a Republican, uh, on the advice of a Republican head of the Fed, Arthur Burns, introduced wage and price controls. We did that uh, in 1975. Uh, OPEC won uh, the first uh, episode where OPEC got together and tried to raise uh, oil prices and succeeded beyond its own expectations. Uh, whip inflation now, after Nixon resigned in 74, uh, Gerald Ford took over as president, the former congressman, and to get rid of inflation, which was running 6-7% at the time, he devised this uh, basically advertising program called Whip Inflation Now. And what does the acronym spell? Win. win. And so they handed out win buttons, uh, millions, hundreds of millions of win buttons, uh, I had one for a time. I wish I'd kept it because uh, it would help me in my own personal battle against inflation today because uh, you can sell them for uh, you know, more money than you got them for. And uh, that didn't work. In our, in our country, 1974 was the uh, uh, Zap Your Frozen uh, election, federal election campaign. Uh, the Conservative Party, the opposition party, Progressive Conservative Party at the time, uh, proposed that we have wage and price controls and the government of the day said what a silly idea and, ridic and Pierre Trudeau who was terrific at ridicule uh, went around the country saying zap you're frozen zap you're frozen my opponents want to freeze prices it's a ridiculous idea uh, he waited until November 1975 to actually do it it was a sort of a you know 18 month period of uh, respectability before he could uh, turn around and uh, it was like uh, George H.W. Bush saying, read my lips, no new taxes. And then 18 months later in 1981, uh, uh, 1991, agreeing to a uh, tax increase with uh, Congress. Voters didn't like it much, but in fact, uh, Trudeau was, uh, uh, well, he, he was eventually reelected, but there was one period of punishment. We had an anti-inflation board that administered prices as well. Uh, in 1979, another uh, episode of OPEC, uh, and then the hero, in many ways, of the 1970s, in economics terms at least, Paul Volcker, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman, uh, arrives and uh, institutes a different program. Uh, and uh, he actually does whip inflation, but it took a while uh, to do it. Okay, back to charts. Uh, the consumer uh, price index, um, again, the red stuff, not much is happening. The official target in Canada, of course, is uh, uh, 1 to 3 percent with a 2 percent mid-range. Uh, and you can see this is moving around a little bit, probably heading up a little bit, but basically no, no trend. Uh, COVID hits and prices actually 
decline. We have deflation for a while, but then prices start rising. Uh, and if you look at the slope of that curve, it's, it's equal to anything that happened, almost anything that happened uh, in the 1970s. In the 70s, sorry, this starts in 1965, uh, 2%, under 2% inflation, hitting the target that we now have. But slowly through the late 1960s, inflation rose. And inflation going over 4%, the discussions, I actually do remember them, it was like civilization was ending. Uh, what were we going to do with an inflation rate greater than uh, 4%? Governments tried to address it. Uh, there was some tightening of monetary policy. There were wage and price controls. Before wage and price controls, there were guidelines, like, you know, please, in your upcoming labor negotiation, don't ask for too much, don't give for too much. Uh, there was job owning was the technique. The president or the prime minister would get on TV and would move his jaw and, and try to get people to stop asking for more money. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, a bit of a recession down here did work, uh, but then you get big increases in uh, the price of oil. I'll show you that in a minute. And the thing more or less takes off. Towards the end of the 70s, you get some improvement, and then it takes off again. And... Uh, uh, a lot of writers of the period argue, and historians of the period argue, it, the inability to control inflation had a debilitating effect on people. Uh, debilitating politically, because you, know, you elect somebody to be in control and they can't control it. Uh, and uh, uh, debilitating sort of emotionally for people because uh, you get a raise, but then, boy, prices go up too much. What do you what do? You, do? You're, you think you caught up and, and then, you know you're behind again. Um, so the anxiety that a lot of economists, I think, would feel when they see that graph, it's nice that it goes down, at the, the red stuff goes down at the very end, but you know that big increase is not a good thing. Uh, the unemployment rate through the 1970s, and this was perplexing uh, in ways I'll discuss, uh, the unemployment rate uh, tended to rise. Uh, the theory was that when the unemployment rate went up, that would slow down the economy and that would reduce inflation. So you might have higher unemployment, but at least you'd have lower inflation. There was going to be a trade-off between inflation and uh, unemployment. But steadily through the 1970s, uh, you can see that even the, the base, the, the level, the, the, the minimum level it reached every time there was a cycle that hit bottom and then headed back up, was higher. Right, so uh, unemployment was steadily increasing through that time. What have we got? We started off with higher unemployment than in 1965 to 70. We had the big spike from uh, COVID, and then you know things seem to be going. Uh, if, if we put a little more data on, that red line would continue downward. Uh, oil prices. Uh, West Texas Intermediate is many people's favorite oil price. Uh, both are 100, 1965 for the blue and, and 2015 uh, for the red are at 100. In the case of the blue, I think it's $2.67 a barrel for the U.S., something like that. Uh, and nothing happens, right? For the longest time, nothing happens. Uh, it, it goes up a little bit in 73, but then after the Yom Kippur War, OPEC decides to embargo oil sales to the United States and the Western world, and the price rises quite substantially. So that's, I'm measuring that not in price, but uh, with those initial years equal to 100. Uh, and so uh, here you're going up to almost uh, 400. Uh, here, by the end of the decade, you're up to 1,400. Right? So what started at 100 by the end of the decade was at 1,400. That's a big... <laughs> it's a big increase. Uh, we've had a, a big increase as well in, uh, in the red stuff, but, you know, although we, we were impressed by last year's uh, spike in, in prices, not much happening. It goes down. It's a big increase from here to here, but this is COVID. Nobody expected. I took a picture at my local gas station of, you know, 65 cents a liter. 
because uh, it was so un unusual. Uh, nobody expected 65 cents a liter to, to stay where it was or whatever the equivalent price was in, in terms of barrels. Uh, so we're, you know, we've had a doubling maybe of the price of oil, but we haven't had so far 14 times. And you know, let's hope that we don't have uh, 14 times increase, but clearly that was a very difficult environment uh, in the 70s. Federal deficit as percentage of GDP. Uh, the blue stuff, well, it just kind of deteriorates, right? Uh, government spending more than it's taking in in uh, tax revenue, building up debt. Uh, we started off at roughly the same deficit uh, post-2015, uh, went into deficit. It was going to be a temporary deficit. COVID came along, and it became almost a record uh, deficit. You have to go back to wartime to see similar deficits. Uh, there has been a recovery, but we're still at something like 4% of GDP in deficit. So the question arises, are we going to continue? Are we going to get back to surpluses? Uh, would that be a good idea? Or are we going to just sort of rumble along at minus uh, 4% in terms of a budget balance? The consequences for debt can be significant, of course. Uh, through the 70s, uh, you had more or less finally paid off uh, wartime uh, debt, and the debt trends were favorable, right? 20, 26% of GDP, something like that, down to here in uh, 1973, in fact. And then, because you do start running deficits through the decade, you got the debt starting to rise. And uh, it rises, as we know, through the 70s, through the mid-80s, to uh, quite high levels. Uh, and then in the 90s, uh, there was retrenchment, uh, and we got that deficit, and we got the deficit into surplus, and we got uh, debt back down as a share of GDP. The red stuff starts off at a higher level. Uh, many economists would have argued, you know, you don't want to consistently run substantial debts because what happens if you get into trouble, right? What happens if something bad comes along, like a pandemic, and you want to spend a lot of money? Well, the consequence of spending a lot of money is the debt to GDP ratio is going to jump the way it did uh, in uh, 2020 and 2021. And, you know, maybe it's going to come back down, maybe it's not going to come back down. Uh, there's a federal uh, budget coming up, and the Minister of Finance is talking about fiscal responsibility, so that's encouraging. But in this business, you just, you know, it's not the words, it's the numbers uh, that count. Okay, well, the uh, heroes, uh, sort of, some of them more confident than others of this uh, uh, story about central banks and the anguish of central banking. Louis Rasminski uh, took over from Andrew Coyne's father uh, in 1961 after Andrew Coyne's father got into James Coyne got into a fight with the government, the conservative government of the day, uh, and Rasminski ended up replacing him after he resigned and basically in principle. Uh, he lasted till 1973, and Gerald Bowie, um, I think it was 73, came in and lasted until the mid-80s. Uh, so those are the two Canadians in the picture. Uh, the three Americans... Uh, Arthur Burns, who was a Nixon appointee, uh, Republican, uh, served from 70 to 78, and he wrote the article, gave the talk a year after his uh, term ended about the anguish of central banking. Uh, he was replaced by uh, a Democratic appointment, Jimmy Carter's appointment of uh, William Miller, who was actually a businessman, uh, head of Textron, which was a conglomerate, uh, didn't really know much about monetary policy, wasn't really interested in it very much. Uh, and he lasted a year and a half. The Carter administration got into political trouble. It did a cabinet shuffle, and this guy quit as Federal Reserve Chair and became Secretary of the Treasury. And the person who replaced them is the guy who looks deep and lost in, in thought on the right-hand side, six-foot-eight-inch Paul Volcker, uh, who at the time was a sm cigar smoker. I mean, it, obviously, those are congressional, that's congressional testimony that they were given. He's smoking a cigar. 
And Arthur Burns was famous for a pipe. Often a pipe is a prop, so you can, you know, think about what you're gonna, how you're going to answer a question. You, you, you make a show of this, and then you hope you figure out an answer to the question. Uh, and, and Volcker took over in August 1979, and uh, um, inflation kept rising. The markets seemed unconvinced by uh, increases in short-term interest rates of 25 basis points. Uh, and so in October 1979, after a trip to Europe, there was an emergency meeting of the Fed on a Saturday, which never happens, a Saturday evening press conference, uh, which most reporters were not very happy about. And the Fed went over to monetarism. It said, we're not going to jerk around with little interest rate increases now, uh, from now on. What we're going to try to do is control the money supply. And if we tighten the money supply a lot, that may actually cause interest rates to skyrocket. And we don't care. Didn't quite say we don't care. But the message went out, this is going to be a cost of getting rid of uh, inflation. And uh, I've been reading Volcker's memoirs, and they do oral histories at the Fed. They have lots of money at the Fed, so they can hire very good historians to interview each other and uh, publish the transcripts. And they didn't know what was going to happen as a result. What was your estimate of where interest rates were going? They were going to go up, but we didn't know where they were going to go. Well, they hit 20% interest rates right, uh, in the early 1980s. So uh, Robert J. Samuelson, who's I think quite a well-respected uh, former columnist now at the Washington Post, wrote a book called The Great Inflation, and he argues that Volcker's uh, decision to um, uh, do this and to beat inflation no matter what uh, was the most beneficial economic policy decision in the last 50 years in the United States. So uh, I think it was last year that Volcker died. Uh, he gave up smoking, incidentally, uh, shortly after becoming chair because his daughter was a nurse and she persuaded him. And um, so for 30 years, he didn't smoke. But he's, he's well known with, you know, those are the famous uh, pictures of him. Um, what went wrong in the 1970s? I'd say that there are these sort of five uh, possibilities. I won't get too technical because I can't get too technical. I'm not, I'm not a technical economist, as, uh, as uh, Harry uh, indicated. I think I do have one equation, however. Uh, which will surprise you. Um, there's, to a certain extent, there was missing macroeconomic theory. Keynesian economics was formed by John Maynard Keynes, written by John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s, where the problem was the Great Depression. And I think there's pretty well unanimous agreement among economists. The problem was demand collapsed, partly because the banking system in several countries collapsed. The United States lost 10,000 banks in the 1930s. Maybe that suggests they had too many tiny banks, but they lost 10,000 of them. And that, that's a big shock if your local bank goes out of business and you had money in it, that, that could be a problem before there's deposit insurance. Right? So that was regarded as a demand side problem. People stop buying because they don't have any incomes. How do we get them to buy again? We've got to work on aggregate demand. What seemed to be happening in the 1970s, people began to realize, was that it was a supply-side problem. OPEC puts up the price of oil by 1,400%. You know? uh, there are difficulties in the labor market. Uh, I'll show you in a minute the um, part labor force participation rate. Uh, it goes up in the 1970s, uh, largely because a lot of the young people and a lot of women are entering the workforce. At the time, we referred to such people as secondary workers, not to insult them, but merely to reflect the fact that many of them, not all of them, many of them, were the second earner in a family. And maybe it was not so crucial for the uh, second earner in a family to have a job because there was a first earner. So you might take a little longer time to search for the right job. Or if a job isn't very good, you might quit it and undergo a spell of unemployment and so on. 
So the character of the labor market was changing, and that was causing unemployment to rise. The unemployment rate naturally, if that's the technical term, to rise. Uh, and that made it difficult for central bankers because central bankers at, at that time had been trained, we got to go for 4% unemployment. 4% unemployment is full employment. Well, if you get the character of the labor market changing uh, as, as time passes, and maybe 4% really isn't attainable anymore, uh, that's a supply side problem. Maybe your economy isn't capable of producing what it was uh, producing. There's also the problem of inflation dynamics. Um, and uh, I'll show you a chart in a minute where I talk about that. Faulty policy tools. Uh, in Canada, in 1975, we decided we were going to target the money supply, something called M1, which is cash and demand deposits. You used to be able to write checks and give checks to people, and uh, that was regarded as currency because people would accept it like a currency, and it was in your deposit, and then it was out of your deposit because they took it. Um, so the, the government or the central bank decided we're going to target M1. We think, you know, inflation could be a problem of too much money chasing too few goods. Uh, and so we're going to target uh, the amount of money in the economy. We're going to reduce it. The problem is, uh, as they were doing that, people's habits about how much money they were going to use changed. Mm -hmm. Interest rates were going up. People decided to economize, economize on money. Some of the first electronic means of transmitting, transmitting money started to come in. I would show you my bank card, except somebody will put it online and then I'll lose all my money. It has, out of the 15 digits or so, it has about 12 zeros. I am really old. I got one of the first bank cards from the Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, and, you know, it's, so it's zero, 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 zero. Uh, somewhere, uh, you know, sometime, I hope they're going to put me in a Hall of Fame. And, and give me a monetary reward for, for doing so. Um, so uh, the, what you were aiming at, the target started moving around. Right? And it's, it's like driving a car. The old analogy is if you're the central banker, you're driving a car, you want to put the brakes on because the economy is going too fast. But the brakes have a variable response. Sometimes when you hit the brakes, you get an immediate response and you sort of hit your head on the windshield. This is before airbags. Uh, and, but other times, you know, you're not getting much of a response at all. You have to pump and pump and pump. Maybe your brakes are like this already, but, uh, you know, if you're driving a car like that, it's not, it's not much fun. So faulty policy tools could have been a problem. An inhospitable intellectual environment, I'll talk about that in a second. And central bank dependence. Uh, a number of the memoirs I've been reading and a couple of the histories in preparation for this suggest the idea that we have now that central banks should be independent uh, and stand alone in the operation, at least, of monetary policy really came along in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Thanks in part to Paul Volcker, who created the impression that central banks know what they're doing. Uh, and politicians decided, well, you know, these folks seem to know what they're doing. This is not a fun problem to have. We'll let them do it. But in the 70s, you don't get that. Uh, Richard Nixon would call Arthur Burns into the office and talk about what he wanted to happen to uh, interest rates. Volcker himself was called into the office by uh, James Baker, who was the uh, chief of staff to Ronald Reagan in the summer of 1984, leading up to the presidential election in which Reagan won a landslide. And Reagan didn't say anything. Volcker reports that he seemed uncomfortable. Baker said... The president is ordering you not to raise interest rates before the election. That's not central bank independence. If the president says, you know, you have to keep interest rates. Volcker said, well, my first thought was, we're not going to raise interest rates. We're going to lower them, if anything. And the second was, this is totally inappropriate. So he apparently he got up, all six foot eight of them, and walked out without saying anything. Uh, I haven't read Baker's memoir yet of that. But that's central bank dependence. And if your central bank's dependent when you're trying to fight inflation and win elections for your political sponsors at the same time, you get into a sort of stop-go policy. You know, with the, if the election is in the, safely in the distance, uh, 
uh, well, let's go after inflation. If the election's approaching, well, maybe we can't go after inflation so much. We have to lower interest rates, accept more inflation, and try to reduce the unemployment rate. So uh, this guy is uh, Bill Phillips, a New Zealander, who uh, is known mainly for the Phillips curve, which is the curve on the right, uh, which he discovered in 1958. I've read that the article, this is something that happens in the internet age, but he submitted the article to Economica one day and it appeared the next. I don't quite know how this happened because they did have to print it at that time. <coughs> Maybe they just got it in at, you know, just as the issue was going to press. Uh, but anyway, uh, very influential article. Some estimates, the most cited article in macroeconomics in the century, the last century. Uh, what it does is suggest that uh, inflation and unemployment are related in this way. Uh, if the unemployment rate falls, this is 100 years of British uh, unemployment data and wage increase data. Uh, if the unemployment uh, rate falls, that tightens up the economy, people have more bargaining power, uh, and you get bigger wage increases. If, as Marx himself might have said, if you run a reserve army in the unemployed, you get less inflation, right? You may actually get deflation. This is below the line. And Phillips uh, did some econometrics basically by hand because they didn't have many computers in those days and the, and the programs for doing econometrics weren't very good and came up with this uh, 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 curve. And the argument was, you know, well, you, you pick a place on the curve, uh, either you, like, no inflation, but you're going to have to have lots of unemployment, uh, or you want to you, uh, uh, want to get unemployment down to a minimum, but you're going to have to accept inflation. And the argument that the, the feeling that people had was this was a permanent trade-off. You could see it in the data, right? So probably from 1960 to 65, uh, a lot of people, a couple of economic reports of the president seem to suggest that you know, they're buying into this and we're just going to move the economy a little further down towards fuller employment. And if we have to take some inflation, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, this, you know, Phillips didn't like that because his early work in economics, he was an engineer by training, uh, was all about expectations and what happens when expectations change. And if you, if, you, you know, if you push down on the unemployment rate and the inflation rate goes to 4%, maybe you're gonna start thinking, hey, I'm living in a world now where standard inflation is 4%. If I wanna get ahead, I might have to go to six or eight, you know, I gotta ask for a bigger, but, uh, when you read about the Phillips curve, you tend to think, oh, well, this guy was an engineer and not very smart. You know, good with drawing curves, but didn't really understand the economics of it. But in fact, he did understand the economics of it, didn't like the use that the Phillips curve was put to by um, people who wanted to move down it and uh, uh, reduce the unemployment rate. And it favored, his pol favorite policy was zero inflation. He liked zero inflation. And to show you that he did understand what he was doing. This supposedly is a copy of the letter, uh, the envelope, empty envelope, that sitting on a park bench in Cambridge in 1952, he wrote out for Milton Friedman, a name probably known to you, father of monetarism, uh, rampant anti-inflationist, uh, showing how adaptive expectations work, showing that expectations do adapt over time, and in 1967, Milton Friedman uh, gave the presidential address to the American Economic Review saying, you know, this Phillips curve doesn't work because people adapt their expectations. Well, you know, Phillips knew that and it kind of looked like Friedman was dumping on Phillips, but uh, in any case, over time, um, Richard Lipsey in his presidential address to the Canadian Economics Association in 1981 uh, said that it took about five years for the um, uh, profession, the economics profession, to sort of understand that there wasn't this permanent trade-off, that if you push hard on inflation, you're going to get accelerating uh, inflation. I, I was in graduate school at the time. That understanding didn't get through to me because I was still puzzled by it. 
And, I, you know, a lot of uh, central bankers weren't uh, PhD economists who were up on the very latest results on the Phillips curve, uh, and I don't think they got it. Uh, so it took a while for this idea that, well, maybe you can't play this game on a permanent basis to get through. So, you know, I, you give people slack if, if they're trying to implement at the head of the Federal Reserve Board or the Bank of England or the Bank of Canada policies that have just been understood uh, at the leading edge of economic uh, theory. Uh, this labor force participation rate, this is the story I told you. Uh, and it doesn't go back to 1965, the series I'm using, but it's rising, right? More and more people are coming into the labor force. Uh, but they're of a, a different type than the sort of s head of single families that had been typical through the 1960s. And their labor force behavior might be different. There are also changes in laws that take place. In Canada, there was a big change in unemployment insurance laws in 1971 that tried to make it sort of easier to experience unemployment. We want it to be nice to the unemployed. But, you know, if you're nicer to people in the state of unemployment, they might not be quite so anxious to get out of the state of unemployment. They may search a little longer. They may decide, I'll take another couple of weeks. You know, and then they can exercise their preferences differently. Uh, and so that may have an effect. But, uh, you know, people should keep track of that, but you're doing this in real time. And, you know, the, the leading edge labor economists are figuring this out and writing about it in the Brookings Institution. But, you know, I guess it's your job to try to keep up if you're president, but, you know, there's so many things going on when you're president. You've got to give the State of the Union and, and so on. The, the spirit of the age. Um, this is John Kenneth Galbraith, who was born in Canada and uh, had uh, died at the age of 98, I think, uh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, very influential economist. You can see he was on the cover of Time magazine twice, once when he was appointed ambassador to India and once when he was criticizing the Johnson administration in early 1968, writing essays about why they should get out of Vietnam. Uh, and there he is wearing a snappy suit from 1977, uh, just as his TV series, The Age of Uncertainty, is about to go on air, in which he sort of explains the economic system in a way that suggests that it's not really a competitive enterprise system. You've got big companies that run the show, and uh, therefore the price level is whatever they want it to be, and there's no point in trying to beat down inflation because the structure of your system keeps producing inflation. These are two books. I'd, I'd recommend them, reading them for their historical uh, interests, but also they're really funny. Right? The, guy is a, the guy's an amazing writer. He was an amazing writer. I, I always found him really entertaining. He got me interested in economics. I got unburdened of his view of the world eventually. But, uh, and, and of course, a lot of the references will be. It's 1958, 1967. 1958, The Affluent Society was a very influential book. Uh, if the 60s were liberal, well, maybe he just caught a wave, but he may also have helped generate the wave. Uh, the argument was the private sector is very well developed. We've got to develop the public sector. In the U.S., that led to uh, the war on poverty, uh, and uh, uh, you know, th there was a retrospective on Joe Biden's first two years uh, recently, and they had a guy on who, from the Johnson Library who's, I don't know, curator of the library, and he went through, you know, Joe Biden did okay. He had two or three major pieces of legislation, Johnson in 1964-65 had like 20 well-known pieces of legislation. So, um, and some of that was probably from Galbraith, and Galbraith was in the Kennedy administration and stayed on for a while in the Johnson administration. Uh, did it influence Canada? This is from the New York Times, arguing that uh, the prime minister of the day thought that wage and price controls were a Galbraithian uh, policy, and. Uh, um, so, I, I, you know, how do you measure influence uh, of how people think? I tend to think uh, uh, Galbraith was important at that time. So what went wrong in the 2020s? Now, the 2020s aren't over yet, so maybe we can redeem ourselves and maybe the 2020s won't go so wrong. Obviously, uh, COVID came along and that 
will excuse at least some of what's gone wrong, is their missing macroeconomic theory uh, that caused policymakers to go astray in terms of how much aggregate demand or aggregate supply they produce. I don't think so. I mean, I'm not a theorist. It seems to me that aggregate demand and aggregate supply stories can still tell you useful things about prices. The difficulty, of course, is in the, POVID, in the uh, pandemic environment, in the COVID environment, you don't know exactly where your aggregate demand is, and you don't know exactly where your aggregate supply is. You know, if people ask you uh, March 15th, uh, 2020, okay, what's the unemployment rate going to be three months from now? People would give you opinions, but, you know, they should be locked up because uh, it's irresponsible to give an opinion. It's a completely uncertain uh, situation. So I, I cut people a lot of slack who were trying to run policy and say, well, you know, we'll, we'll do this to the interest rate and that'll cause an increase in demand of a such certain amount and that'll snuggle up to w the rate at which aggregate supply is growing or collapsing and, and that'll cause the inflation rate to be stable. I, you know, I think the theory's there, but in this completely uncertain environment, uh, the theory is very hard to apply. You just don't have the data on where you are. You're, complete, you're driving in the dark. You're driving in a, in a complete blizzard. Uh, an elusive natural rate. Yes, to a certain extent. We don't know what is the rate of unemployment right now that would, going beyond it, would be inflationary. Right? Because uh, we haven't been in a, an economy of this sort. Uh, before. That's getting less and less true because the unemployment rate's going back to levels we understand and sort of crazy behavior in the labor market and aggressive behavior by the government to get people out of the labor market or into the labor market. That's all fading now. So we're getting back more to normal times. Uh, but uh, I think the natural rate is uh, somewhat elusive. Faulty policy tools. I don't think so. Um, we're not, tar I, we, I edit the FP comment page and we do get people submitting uh, and we sometimes publish them uh, monetarist tracks that say where we've gone wrong is we're not paying attention to the money supply. Um, I think our readers should know that argument. I'm not convinced that that's uh, a great argument. Um, the standard uh, Policy tools of central bankers raise interest rates, try to pull back on demand, aiming at the inflation rate. I, I think those tools are still working. It's a little hard, uh, as I suggested, to figure out how are people going to respond if you're giving them lots of income um, out of the fisc to make up for their lost income in the labor market. How are they going to respond to an increase or a decline in interest rates? It's not easy, but I don't, I don't know that the tools themselves are not working the way they're used to, we're used to them working. An inhospitable intellectual environment, I'm a conservative. I always think the environment in this country and in most Western countries is inhospitable. Uh, I don't think people are uh, very fond of market processes. I don't think they would, if you went and asked them to get rid of inflation, is it okay if the unemployment rate goes to 10%? Uh, you know, I think you'll get a resounding no. Um, then if you start asking long-term questions, is it okay if, uh, you know, the inflation rate goes to 15% or 20% or is it okay if it just keeps at 12% forever and jumps up and down 5 or 6%? I, I think they'll probably agree that it's a, a problem that should be addressed. Um, central bank dependence, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think... Uh, Central banks are sort of kowtowing to uh, finance ministers or presidents or prime ministers uh, as much certainly as they did in the 60s, 70s, and uh, maybe into the 80s. Uh, so I don't think that went wrong. Uh, so I, th I think we've got a, a problem with our environment that people may not tolerate the monetary policy that's going to be necessary to get rid of the inflation, uh, if I'm right that it's going to be substantial. Uh, and we do have difficulties in trying to figure out exactly where we are because it's a difficult and unprecedented circumstance that we're in. Um, 
Okay, what goes around comes around. That was the original question. I guess I should answer the original uh, question. Does, you know, people always ask, does history repeat itself? How many times has Poland been invaded? It probably does. How many times have the prime minister and the premier solved health care for a lifetime? Four or five in my lifetime. Um, so history does repeat itself to a certain extent. People who don't think it repeats itself say, well, it rhymes. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I mean, it sounds great. I've used it probably in a column. I've used basically everything in a column. Um, and, but I'm not entirely sure what that means. Does it echo? Yes, there are certain echoes. We, we do have a Trudeau uh, as uh, prime minister. Does it provide new but sort of equally complex environments uh, containing what may appear to be similar patterns? I think that's probably true. Uh, does history teach? The most famous phrase here is, uh, you know, uh, George Santayana in 1905, a philosopher, not an economist. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I think that's entirely debatable, right? Uh, people say, well, you know, if you don't remember the past, you're condemned to, rep to repeat it. You might luck out. Remembering, you know, the, the fact that uh, something is happening that happened before and you don't know that it happened before doesn't mean it's going to turn out exactly the same uh, way. This seems to me to be certainly a, a little too deterministic. So maybe, maybe not. Two things I would suggest. Inflation control in the 1970s was really hard and took a long time. Right? Uh, people were talking about inflation control really from 1967 or 68 on. Uh, and the U.S. brought in controls in 1971 and brought in monetarism in 1979. And uh, the inflation rate, you know, hit 12, 14 percent in the early 1980s. Uh, and so that, that was a long time. And, it, you know, it was hard to do. It put the economy through a ringer in many respects, partly because policy was indecisive and had this stop-go asp aspect to it. Um, it was also hard because interest rates finally had to go up pretty high. I've got a, one final graph on that. But also this argument that inflation was, you know, socially debilitating. People on the left, I've always thought, should be most concerned about inflation because it does give the impression that nobody's in control and that the government is incompetent. Governments come out year after year after year and say, we're going to get inflation under control. They did through the 1970s. I remember it. They said the same about budget deficit and the federal debt. Uh, that went into the 1980s, their promises. Year after year after year, they promised, and it didn't happen. Well, if your government promises you something actually quite important to your life and says they're going to fix it and they don't fix it, I think the natural reaction is skepticism about government in general. I'm not on the left, so if people are skeptical about government in general, I'm not displeased. But those who are on the left, I think, should really uh, pay attention to this problem of inflation. Um, and then this sort of discouraging aspect of, uh, well, you think you've finally started earning enough and then the price level goes up. You think you've finally saved enough and the price level goes up. Uh, here's this final um, graph. When you really got serious about inflation, short-term interest rates peaked. And they actually, I didn't have, I, I wasn't able to put this over here, but just imagine, I won't take out a pen and write on this lovely screen, but 1982, real short-term interest rates, the interest rate that was observed minus the inflation rate, got to 9.5% in this country and higher in the United States. So if you went to borrow money, it was going to cost you in real terms 9.5%. And uh, that, was, that was serious, and that got the job done through a rip-roaring recession. What have we done lately? We've never really had real... You know, in the 60s, they had real interest rates that were above zero, so they weren't unused to them. But in the mid-70s, inflation took off and the interest rate didn't as much. We haven't had them. There's a, a period where you have a real interest rate greater than zero by this sort of clumsy and awkward measure of real interest rates. Where are we now? We're trying to stop inflation with a real interest rate that's still well below zero. If in the early 90s, if in the early 80s, it also was the same in the early 90s, 
it took a real interest rate of 9.5%, and in this country, in the early 90s, it was 9.6% uh, to knock the stuffing out of inflation. Is minus four going to do it? It's a different economy, different psychology. Um, the one advantage is that people do understand that the Bank of Canada is capable of going completely crazy uh, and raising interest rates dramatically. And so that's like a big boomerang, you know, or a big, sorry, howitzer, uh, or I guess they called it a boomerang in the, in the fiscal, in the financial crisis era. Um, bazooka, sorry, not boomerang, but bazooka. You don't want a boomerang that uh, has any power to it. Um, so maybe people know, okay, so the Bank of Canada, it's, it's, it's putting interest rates up a little bit, and it looks like it's determined, and we know what happened in the 80s, and we know what happened in the 90s, and we're not condemned to repeat history. We can anticipate they're going to do it again. But, of course, there's some doubt, right, because of this zeitgeist. Uh, are people, in fact, willing to have the Bank of Canada go crazy again? Is the Bank of Canada willing to go crazy? Uh, I don't know. So does what goes around, does what go around? Come? I, I don't know the tenses on that, uh, the usage, but I think you know what I mean. I don't know is the answer. Uh, maybe it does. At the moment, we're in a sort of a nice phase, right? The Bank of Canada finds that the inflation rate's been coming down a bit, uh, both year over year, which is all basically old data. It's, it's 11 months we already know. It's, it's only the last month that's new. But if you look at the last two or three months, it's almost on target, so it's, it's not bad. And the bank is sort of leaping at the opportunity to pause the increase in interest rates and say, let's have a look, let's see. That sounds perfectly reasonable, right? Tiff Macklem, who many of us know, the governor of the Bank of Canada, some of us probably taught, did you? Maybe Robin taught him, I don't know. Because um, I think he's from Queens, right? Yeah. Um, extremely reasonable guy, he's from Queens. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question you got to ask is, is he going to be willing, if push comes to shove, to do what Paul Volcker did and then what John Crow did in Canada in the early 1990s and raise interest rates quite high so that we're sure that we get rid of this fast so that we don't, it doesn't linger through the rest of the decade and screw up the rest of the decade and put our misery index up to where the 1970s misery index was. And, you know, that's tough to ask of anybody, but that seems to be the way we do it. I think I've gone way beyond my time. Uh, Joe Biden is probably speaking already. I know you want to rush off and hear what he has to say. Um, uh, but uh, if there's a question period, I'm happy to answer questions. And if there are no questions, that's okay. That's kind of there's going to be a written version of this. If you didn't understand a word, I'm hoping it'll be clearer in writing, but... So do we have any, yeah, so do we have any questions? I see a question back there. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> 
since the beginning of this century, which I have to get used to, is the 21st century. 21st century. Um, since I wrote the book, I haven't looked at the numbers much. But um, I think the child tax benefit, uh, you know, if you looked at the numbers on uh, inequality in Canada and poverty in Canada, I think poverty is the more important concern. Uh, as long as people at the bottom are doing okay, I don't really care what luxuries people at the top uh, give themselves. And I'm not sure that the two are, the people at the bottom are poor because the people at the top are rich. But, and that's the theme of the, of the book. Um, if you look at the numbers, the, the poverty rate at, at the turn of this century among uh, single parent families, largely single mother families, was about 40%. So about 40% of them, there are problems with measuring poverty, which measure do you accept? And so if you look at the stat can standard measure, it was about 40%. By the time that book was written, it was down to 20%. And part of that was you know, the child tax benefits, uh, um, our version of the um, sort of work fair uh, credits, tax credits, uh, the Whitby, um, which the uh, former finance minister, now deceased, uh, uh, um, named that way because he was from Whitby, uh, Ontario. Uh, so it, you know, paying cash in that respect uh, is is going to have that sort of effect. Uh, I, th I think that's the major. Uh, it was a, an explicitly redistributive uh, tax uh, and benefit package, and. I think that works, right? uh, and I would prefer that when we do go after income redistribution, we do it explicitly and show the money rather than saying, you know, farmers are worthy people and we're therefore going to fix the price of milk for them. Uh, there are probably others that I could mention, but I've, you know, you've caught me. Uh, I was so enthralled to hearing my pros come back at me like this. I was, I was, I was glad the chairman didn't say, is there a question, please? Because it was so pleasant to hear. That book, by the way, is available at University of Toronto Press. Uh, there is a Kindle version. You can buy it as we speak. Uh, I think the hardcover is substantially reduced in price, alas. <laughs> but uh, it still does exist. We can do some redistribution of that sort, but I think by and large, uh, you know, I'm a conservative. I want, but I think by and large, uh, you know, I'm a conservative. I want them to do less. Name me something the government doesn't do these days. Uh, it's hard to do. If you go through the, I, I did a column a couple of weeks ago. I can almost remember what I wrote. Uh, I, w I went through the list of federal government agencies. It's something like 561 agencies, right? The tomorrow's column will be about the our representative uh, for uh, Islamophobia. I'm sure Islamophobia is a, a problem. I'm sure right-thinking people are not Islamophobic. I don't think paying $5 million a year to an official federal representative on Islamophobia or under the former conservative government, religious freedom, or, you know, you can think of any number of these things, is either right or is going to be effective. Right? Uh, the punchline of the column will be, if it goes over well here, uh, if you want to, you know, who do you, who do you want to persuade? You want to persuade Islamophobes. Right? You don't appoint a Muslim lady to go and tell Islamophobes, you got to clean up your act, you know? you gotta, you got to pick somebody from the social milieu who understands that their viewpoint needs to be changed and also understands 
if somebody says, I'm from the federal government, and I'm going to tell you that the way you think is wrong, you know, that's not going to have a positive effect. Probably going to have a negative effect. So there's a whole range of these things. Industrial policy. You know, I, I think the, 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 we're setting up all sorts of funds and foundations that are going to pick the innovative, successful, profitable, green uh, inventions of the future. And we're going to do it in Ottawa with 16 or 18 departments having a say uh, and having to you know, submit everything to um, federal government lawyers to make sure there's no contribution, uh, contravention of any. So I, I would just say, you know, I have a, it's a simple message. Reduce the influence of the government on the economy and the society in general. And if we want to get rid of Islamophobia, let's go get rid of Islamophobia. Let's each of us, you know, do what we have to do. I can write about it. Uh, others can, if they've got uh, people who are Islamophobes or anti-Semites or uh, anti-gay people, uh, you know, you got to take it unto yourself to do it. You hire a bureaucrat to take care of this problem for yourself? I don't, I don't. So anyway, it's so a smaller government would be my answer. Young man up front. Yeah. <laughs> Certain irony in the... So I, you, you seldom get a person like that, actually. The, um, and in the late 70s, I thought he was an idiot, right? I was sort of trendy left and uh, just thought, this guy's an actor, he doesn't know anything, and he's not going to achieve no, anything. <laughs> I do. Um, people are capable of, of learning. I do have a final slide here. Maybe this is not the time to show it. But this, you know that Santa Yana quote I gave you about people condemned to rep people who cannot, whatever the quote was. It's very famous and I can't recite it. Um, this, the very same paragraph has this, which I'll let you read. And, and it, uh, for those I had dinner with who were of a certain age, it's, it's not a very encouraging uh, quote. So what I chirp in my old age may not be the most important thing for people to listen to, but uh, I, I was always uh, very admiring of Robert J. Samuelson. I think he was a terrific columnist for the Washington Post, very balanced uh, and very up to date on what was going on in economics, macroeconomics, uh, uh, in the better uh, U.S. Uh, schools and talked to the... So I have a very favorable impression and I suspect most people who are familiar with him would feel the same thing. His book on the great inflation argues you know, Reagan was, Volcker is, gets all the credit, but Reagan, uh, he, I don't think he mentions the firing the air traffic controllers. The air traffic controllers had pledged as part of their job they would never go on strike because you don't want the planes to fall out of the sky when people leave their jobs. And they went on strike. And Reagan said, I'm sorry, you promised you were not going to go on strike. This is grounds for dismissal. You are dismissed, which was... I mean, you can imagine. Well, you can't imagine because, you know, you have to live through that uh, um, society for 10 or 15 years, see how it was developing. And it was absolutely shocking that he would do this. Uh, Samuelson doesn't actually mention that, but he does mention Reagan's steadfast silence about the fact that the interest rates were going up, the unemployment rate was going up, people were hurting, he would you know, say, yes, we understand you're hurting. There's a job that has to be done. He was completely supportive of uh, Volcker. So he gave Volcker substantial 
independence because he inherited Volcker. Volcker was Carter's. Give credit to Carter. He was Carter's nominee, and he had told Carter, I'm going to be tougher on this issue than William Miller, who was actually sitting in the room when Volcker was interviewed. And Carter phoned him up the next morning and said, you're my man. Um, so Carter helped to a certain extent, but Reagan, who inherited Volcker, inherited high interest rates, um, basically was silent and supportive. And eventually it, it worked, and, and uh, Samuelson argues, well, either the people around him or this Hollywood actor, you know, they weren't so dumb. They understood this job had to be done. It was going to be very painful, but it got done. And it stayed done until, 20, you know, until just after COVID. And uh, uh, so now I think people who are aware of that experience are concerned. We don't want to go back there. That's not a good place to go. And, uh, you know, do you listen to your elders? I know my kids don't. Uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, who can speak of that era except people who have some experience of it, so. Okay, one last question from right at the back. One of the most skeptical of whether Trudeau Jr. has the same uh, uh, skills. So I'm wondering what, what you know to the extent that the current Trudeau actually is up to date on, on it, any of this kind of thinking uh, about how to deal with uh, inflation in the same way that his father was. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't have any information on that, that that you wouldn't have by reading the newspapers um, if you read the National Post. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't, you know, I'm not so sure that Trudeau Sr. was all that involved, you would know more than I, was all that involved in economic policy. The impression you get is that I, I was taught by Eric Kierens, who's a name familiar, that would be familiar to you. And um, uh, he was um, an e economist uh, from McGill who uh, was head of the Chamber of Commerce in Montreal for a while and active in... Uh, liberal circles and became, I think, postmaster general. He's the guy that introduced post, postal codes, the fact that we have postal codes, because he wanted to start running it with machines. And the, um, in his memoirs, he talks about when they went off, when they floated the dollar in 1970, the Canadian dollar, which floated before most other currencies did. We were sort of a pioneer. We had been floating in the 50s. And Kieran's went in to explain to Trudeau why this was a great idea, and um, Trudeau said, well, yeah, you know, basically I'll take your word on this, Eric. And Kieran said, I thought you went to the London School of Economics. And Trudeau said, oh, well, you know what those things are like. Uh, he had been on a sort of uh, vacation tour of major universities and spent some time there, and met some people, but apparently the economics didn't stick. So traditional economics he didn't like, but he was, he did, of course, read a, a tremendous amount and was wonderfully learned in many ways and could recite poetry at great length. And uh, it was a very impressive personality. I think his son is not so impressive. It's not his fault, you know. It'd be hard to reach that standard. I'm not so sure that Trudeau Sr. was such a great prime minister. Trudeau Jr. seems to be lasting at least, you know, and that's, that's one measure. So, um, yes, Trudeau was a sort of salon socialist, a friend of Castro, would not like anything the Americans recommended to him, I think. Uh, and so he would love Galbraith, and did love Galbraith, and referred to Galbraith. But I don't know if he was, uh, I've got to read the Canadian history of that 74, 75 period, and try to figure out who was actually running macroeconomic policy at that time. And I suspect it was somebody in cabinet. And Trudeau would certainly, you know, he would understand the arguments once they were made to him. Uh, and he would understand the, uh, the sex appeal of Galbraith. Hard to believe that a guy like that had sex appeal, but, uh, you know, he was very trendy. Uh, 
and uh, you were avant-garde if you were, if you were uh, following up on this type of uh, policy. So, uh, I mean, my, my impression of Justin Trudeau is no, he's not the intellectual his father was. Um, I don't know if he can write the way his father did, which was very effective in many respects. Um, he has other skills, obviously. Um, he has greater emotional intelligence, if you think that's a thing, uh, than, his father, than his father did. Um, how much in control of uh, policy is he, and will he make the call on, we got to do this. We got to get rid of the inflation. It's going to hurt. So be it. I, d I don't know if he would do that. Um, I don't know if, if Trudeau Sr. did that, or that was basically done for him by Paul Volcker. Okay, well, we have to end it at some point, and yeah. I guess we've reached that point, but you can still catch Bill's column twice weekly. Am I correct? Uh, so anyway, thanks. Thanks to Bill for your insight and for, I'm an economic historian, so I, I love finding out that these issues, which I barely remember, were, were now you know, kind of history. So thanks very much. Now, on behalf of Trent University, on behalf of the Department of Economics, and on behalf of Harry Kitchen, we'll present you with your image along oh, with the Trudeaus to, to remember tonight. And I got to say, the last two years we had to do this uh, online, and I think those talks Speaker's only got a PDF file, so you can see yourself <laughs> very well. That seems appropriate. Thank you so much. That's very good. We can, we can pack that up for you. Good. And before we, we leave, just let me remind you, keep an eye out for the Stairs Lecture and Schindler Lecture happening next month as part of Trent's Community Speaker Series. And thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. And keep thinking about these issues. Uh, and until next time, good night. Oh.